Hi, welcome to the Semantics Lecture about Axion's Art. Axion's Art is also called a lexical aspect, uh, and sometimes even just aspect, which is absolutely confusing, hence the recourse to the German name. The German name stands for uh, action types or event types, and event types is basically what Axion's Art is all about. So, essentially, the, the idea comes from the observation that we can classify different verbs based on their temporal properties, based on the temporal entailments they generate, and based on the different kinds of interactions with the grammar that they have. Uh, and this is called Axionsart, and uh, it um, is most, most uh, clearly associated with the work of Zeno Wendler, and later David Dowdy, but uh, has found a pretty solid place in semantics, both in the non-formal sense and in the formal literature. And today we'll focus on the less formal side of it, and focus on the uh, just the empirical observations. And these observations will focus on English because, we'll, uh, because these facts don't always apply from one language to another. So if you take an example like one, Paul built a house. That's going, that will entail that Paul has built a house. But if you put that in the progressive or the imperfective, Paul was building a house, the entailment goes away. And the entailment goes away because um, uh, he might never have finished the house. So if you look at um, you know, these things, you say, oh, well, the aspect has changed, or we, we get a difference. Okay, that's aspect. That's the viewpoint aspect that we've seen before. But this also applies for different predicates. So if you say Paul worked in Texas, that entails that Paul has worked in Texas. But if you put that in the progressive, Paul was working in Texas. That still entails that Paul has worked in Texas. And so the, since the entailment stays, it's not necessarily simply a property of aspect. It's aspect plus something about the nature of building a house versus working in Texas. We can also classify verbs based on the temporal properties that they have um, when uh, we try to put them, when we try to see what they cannot do in the grammar. So a number of verbs cannot be put in the progressive at all. So if you say uh, see, right, see a movie, Elena saw a movie, fine. Elena was seeing a movie is really weird. Even though we can say she was watching a movie, it's weird to say she was seeing a movie. And other predicates, it's even worse, like know. I can know French, but to say I'm knowing French is not even English. And there's a whole range of verbs that behaves that way. And then in other, in other cases, you can modify certain predicates with some modifiers and not with other modifiers. So the classic case are these in or for prepositional phrases. Temporal adverbials. So if you say Paul built a house in 10 weeks, that's perfectly fine. But if you say he built a house for 10 weeks, then it's a weird sentence, or at least it doesn't mean the same thing. If you say Paul worked in Texas for 10 weeks, that's fine. But if you say Paul worked in Texas in 10 weeks, that's absolutely ungrammatical. And so the, again, we can classify these verbs and they have these different properties with respect to one another. And what we want to try to understand is what kinds of classes can we find? And, and then of course, is there any truth conditional or uh, natural uh, reason for these classes to exist? And so uh, based on the you know, work of Wendler and Dowdy and so forth, uh, we've come up with a classification of different events, event types, and that sort of thing. Now, these events, can, these different predicates are properties of events. Sometimes they're called properties of eventualities. It's a term from Emmen Bach that uh, englobes all the things we're going to talk about here. And the reason why it didn't use events at the top, is because the first division is into states and events. So 
events we've already seen. But what are states? Right? Well, states are kinds, they're like events. It's just that they uh, are essentially the kinds of events or the kinds of eventualities where nothing changes. And states, if, if you stopped the entire universe, events would no longer happen. But states would still hold. If I'm in this spot and everything froze, I would still be in this spot. And so forth. So states, are, you, know, you can think of them as frozen in time. Events you can think of as involving a dynamic change, often from one state to another. So states include you know, believe, uh, be, love, right, these basic verbs, and then many of their uh, predic uh, complements. Now, uh, uh, we can try to figure out, you know, is it, does this hold if nothing, you know, if the world stopped, would this still hold? We could do that. But there's a simpler test, a grammatical test. Right, so we've seen the truth conditions, and now the diagnostic. Diagnostic for states is simple in English. Can you put the progressive on it? If you cannot, then it's a state. Frozen and no progressive. Right, or no imperfecta, as you might say. Now, the events then can be broken down into two types as well. And put uh, telic over here, and the atelic over here. So, telic predicates are those that have a natural endpoint. <coughs> At least they seem like they do. And um, atelic ones are those without. So, to give a simple example, you say I ran a mile, that is telic because there's a, a point where you can reach. And you know if I reach that point, I'm done. I've succeeded. I've run a mile. With an atelic predicate, you don't get that. When you say I ran, then you know there's no you just run until you stop. There's no real point where you can say I did it. Because as soon as you start, you've basically done it. And that's one difference that they entail, right? So atelic entail once you start and telic ones entail only when finished you have to finish it so um, you know, when we saw with building a house build a house is telic so if you were building a house you haven't finished it does not entail that you built a house. Whereas if you run, then as soon as you start, it entails that you've run. And that works for work in Texas, too. Now, there's also, you can work out those entailments, but there's also a simple diagnostic. The diagnostic is um, that telic predicates can be modified by NPPs. Atelic ones can only be modified by 4PPs. Here I can say, I ran to the store in 10 minutes. I ran a mile in 10 minutes. But it's weird to say, I ran a mile for 10 minutes. You can say, I ran to the store for 10 minutes. But then you get the sense that you didn't get there, right? Whereas with atelix, I ran for 10 minutes is fine, but I ran in 10 minutes is just ungrammatical. And that's because in tells us how long it took to reach the natural endpoint. Since these don't have a natural endpoint, you can't really say anything about them. So we can divide atelic and telic. But we can divide those further too. We can divide telic into achievements and accomplishments based on, uh, based on how long the actual event takes. So achievements are instantaneous. They're, they happen in a moment. So, a classic example of reach the top of the mountain. So you're climbing, you're climbing, whatever, and then you reach the top. That moment of reaching the top is an instant. And you can say, um, you know, yeah, I reached the top. Accomplishments take a little longer. 
accomplishments involve the uh, buildup, you could say. And so, um, yeah, it's uh, and this would uh, example. Of this would be climbing the mountain. So reaching the top is an achievement. Boom. Accomplishment is climbing. So you're actually involving that whole process. It's kind of hard to distinguish them, but English allows a very convenient way of doing that. And it's the word almost. If you put almost with an accomplishment, then you can get the sense that you've nearly completed the action. Um, but you can almost get the sense that you almost started the action. Well, you know, so if you're sitting around, like, oh, I'm going to climb Mount Everest, and you decide not to do it. You can say, oh, I almost climbed Mount Everest. Especially if you're like a mountaineer or something. But if you say, I almost climbed Mount Everest, that also is true if you made it 79% you know, away up the mountain, or if you made it up to 100 meters from the summit. But then you had to turn back. That's almost climbing Mount Everest. Reaching the top, though, there's not really that ambiguity. There's only, right, it's hard to say if it's the start or the finish because it's just one moment. So I almost reached the top. Right? There's, there's no buildup to that. You can't say I almost reached the top of Mount Everest, but I couldn't raise the money. You can say that with climb. I almost climbed Mount Everest, but I, didn't, I couldn't raise the money. That's fine. But you can't really do that with achievements. So when you get you know, achievements like that, they're very in a moment. So, atelic events can also be divided. So we have activities, and we have semifactives. Semifactives are the kinds of events that are instants, but which don't really have a natural endpoint. There's not a, they just happen. So verbs like knock, cough, uh, you can include jump sometimes, um, and um, you know, knock on the door, or hit the ground, that sort of, well no, hit the ground is an achievement. Um, but these kinds of atelic events are thought to be atelic because you can modify them with 4PPs, not with NPPs. So you can say I almost I climbed Mount Everest in two weeks. I reached the top of the mountain in two weeks. I knocked on the door in two weeks. It's fine. You can say I knocked on the door for ten minutes. Activities are and the difference between some effects and activities is this: some effects are instants. Activities are things that endure. Endure. They have a duration. And so semifactives, if you put them in the progressive, you get a sense of repetition. When you say, I, I was knocking on the door, then it, you're doing it over and over again. You don't knock and then hold it. Right? The event's over. Activity, though, that gives you a sense of continuity with the progressive. I was holding my hand on the board. That's an activity. You know, but if I'm knocking on the board, that's repetition. So there's a factual difference between them. And um, we also get this a difference <clears throat> if um, we uh, put a 4PP. You say, I knocked on the door for five minutes. Again, Repetition. You say, I held my fist on the door for five minutes. That's just, you held your fist on the door. Like a weirdo for five minutes. So, you get these different event types. Now, these are the five basic ones. Some people have tried to add some. Some people have tried to combine them together. 
But that's basically it. We have states which don't change and events which do. If they change towards a natural endpoint, they're telic. If they just change whichever direction they go, it's atelic. If they if they're telic and they involve the buildup, their accomplishments. If they just involve that little point at the end, their achievements. If they're atelic and they only happen in an instant, they're semifactives. And if they involve a long duration, or even a moderate duration, or any duration at all, their activity. And we can actually organize them by these features, whether they're states or not, whether they have endpoints or not, and whether they have duration or not. And so we get these uh, different uh, verb classes. And if you can find other properties, maybe you can find more classes. But these classes, you know, they interact with the grammar, and they give us different semantic facts. And so they're very useful in organizing different verbs and testing different theories and hypotheses about various morphemes and semantic properties.